Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. This is News Flash Live for the first time since I've been here. Let's start it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Let's get into it. Got a great Saturday of stories today. Coming to you a little bit late on a. The Friday closing it out strong for the end of the month is what we got. We're starting up top with a little bit of, um, you know, foreign espionage, a little bit of a uh, tough play by the Chinese, really pulling off a pretty hardball move. Um, they had an executive, Meng Wangzhou, um, China. Um, she works at Huawei in China, seemingly just took two Canadians off the street to get her back. Um, it is very, very interesting. We'll get into this whole story in the New York Times and fill you all in on what the good old CCP has been up to. Also, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her crying present vote. We'll get into all that. We'll unpack all that craziness. And, you know, it couldn't be newsflash without a completely impromptu, random, but also Super fun and informative trip across the pond. We're going to the UK Labour Conference where there is all sorts of madness going on there. A big moment in that party's future to be decided. Keir Starmer, the current leader there, has a big opportunity to stamp his authority on the party to make sure that no one on the left wing has any power again through procedural rules. But it looks like he's facing a massive revolt. This is Newsflash 563. Let's get into it. Or 564, I don't know. All right. Let's go to the New York Times for this one. In a rapid fire climax to a 1,030-day standoff, China welcomed home a company executive who's arresting Canada and possible extradition to the United States made her a focus of superpower friction. So kind of a Cold War battle almost. Um, if you're talking about between China, uh, kind of the next, the up and coming, you know, I'd say it's very much an analogous to, to use a basketball analogy here to like LeBron James uh, and Giannis Antetokounmpo. Um, like LeBron has been, I was clear dominate, dominating force has been brutal for the rest of the league for in this case, you know, decades upon decades. Um, and there is a kind of, you know, not so much as charged it up, the, the two anima- like the animosity between LeBron, like LeBron um, and uh, LeBron and Giannis don't like fight, but the, the th- situation is uh, that they are, you know, the one is trying to, is or is just naturally going to dethrone the other as like the sole superpower here. And this is definitely a big move. Uh, to see it. So so she is back in the country now uh, after being arrested in Canada to get her back. Beijing brandished a formidable political tool using detained foreign citizens as bargaining chips in disputes with other countries. The executive Meng Wanzhou landed in China on Saturday night, local time, to a public that widely sees her as a victim of arrogant American overreach. Uh, by the same turn, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, two Canadians detained by Chinese officials days after Meng had been arrested, were released and arrived in Canada. So the exchange comes, uh, resolves one of the festering disputes that have brought tensions between Washington and Beijing to their worst point in decades, but it will likely do little to resolve deeper issues in, uh, about human rights, a sweeping clampdown in Hong Kong cyber espionage, China's threats to use force against Taiwan, and fears that Beijing, in Beijing, the United States will never accept China's rise, which is, you know, very clear that they won't. And, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, kind of concentrated economic power that China will try and leverage on them, which is really kind of funny because a lot of people don't talk about this, but the United States really were the people that got, um, Played more of a role as a country than any in terms of you know free trade, um, you know the way the corporations exactly the way the corporations wanted it. American elites pretty much gave rise to China. They enabled they gave China the fuel that it needed to industrialize in probably the most definitely uh, the most rapid and you know efficient way in human history in terms of what they're able to put together in such a quick time and just literally what they've done. 
in terms of committing, you know, we'll see how it goes. But in terms of committing to not use coal, for, um, you know, not work on any electrical power plants. Um, and I think it was something else that you know, Xi Jinping, oh no, yeah, um, <laughs> making Bitcoin illegal in China, uh, which by the by the way, great idea. Uh, it's really s- just you know, it's a financial market waiting to crash. So it's nothing you really want to get into if you're a, trying to like seriously run a country, um, which it seems like China is at the moment. But um, and yeah, that does you know not to not acknowledge the awful things that China's doing to the Uyghur Muslim population and, you know, the surveillance and, and, you know, human rights violations that they have. But the real question is, is America have credibility to make that claim as the, you know, number two dealing with so much of the world for so long? It's going to be really, really interesting and very dramatic to watch for sure. Um, so the swiftness of the apparent deal also stands as a warning to leaders in other countries that the Chinese government, you know, they didn't really say that they did what they just did, but they did what they just did. Um, so they, they, they can be boldly transactional with foreign nationals, said Donald C. Clark, a law professor specializing in China at George Washington University's law school. Um, they are not even making a pretense of a pretense that this was anything but a straight hostage situation, he said, of the two Canadians who stood tr- um, stood trial on spying charges. Spavor was sentenced to last month to 11 years of prison, and Kovri was waiting for a verdict in his case after trial in March. And since China strengthening its bargaining position in future negotiations like this, uh, they're saying if you give them what they want, they will deliver as agreed. And this is something that, by the way, the United States, they used to be able to say, they can't say it anymore. They cannot say it anymore. And that is no small part in a uh, reason that, like, a lot of other countries just do not, like, they're very kind of skittish around making and dealing with the United States. And that is, like, that is something that, you know, they can only blame on one group of people, the National Security Military Industrial Complex. It is themselves. Uh, And I think we have to be the ones, kind of, as American people, you know, to enforce that. Um, Chinese media reports chronicled her release and flight home, skipping over admission of some wrongdoing or saying that it did not amount to a formal guilty plea on China's interest. Ms. Meng was praised a patriotic symbol of China standing up to Western bullying. Her plane was bent on the tarmac at the airport in Shenzhen, China, with a rapturous crowd waving Chinese flags. Without a powerful motherland, I would not have my freedom today, Meng said in a statement issued from her flight. So this is a big, big, you know, what I think clearly is, you know, a big (laughs) muscle flex, a big uh, power play here that has, you know, it's completely paid off um, by the Chinese. So, like, that is, that's really, like, that's really something. Like, that they're able to come out and do that. Like, they're, they're hitting all the right notes. They got... You know, man coming out there, she's like, so, so for the motherland, you know, we are, we did it. So, and she's right. And, you know, it doesn't really matter if she like, I don't even know what she, I don't even know what she was arrested for. And I, I don't even know if that could have been a, you know, worthy cause. You know, it's not like the United States detains people for, you know, for example, for winning cases against big oil companies in their houses for 700 days. They're not allowed to leave. Um, and literally appoints private prosecutors to go after them. So, President Biden has designated China as a key challenge to American preeminence. I mean, he's right about that. And, you know, they're winning, they're challenging and succeeding. The release, the release is, came as he hosted the first face-to-face leaders meeting of the Quad, a grouping of the United States, India, Japan, and Australia. Not about their apprehension about China's power and intentions in Asia. Um, and, you know, those f- three other countries' economic allegiance to the U.S., at least for the time being with India, I think. Uh, this month, Mr. Biden unveiled a new security agreement with Australia and Britain. Plans to, uh, excuse me, plans to provide nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. So that's definitely something worth very, you know, really, really interesting, to say the least. Worth watching for sure. And that will be uh, that. That's going to make enough time for us to move to our next story, and it's not a fun one, but uh, it's going to be definitely a very important one to break down. Dr. Dr. 
Hello, everybody, and welcome to our segment to tell you all about what's going on here on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network this summer. We do, as I'm sure you know, have a great lineup available for you. We, of course, start with our flagship show, Newsflash, all new Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, uncultured, um, irregularly, back every Saturday with live music and sports analysis with my co-host of the summer, Bennett Laxon. Hidden History will be brand new every Thursday on a bit of a hiatus, but will return shortly. It's the summer of podcasting. It's the summer of sounds. All you got to do is just keep listening. Wherever you get your podcasts, always here on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving on to our next story, and that is something to do with a little bit of a little situation around Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and a thing called the Iron Dome in Israel. Um, that is been very controversial and really kind of surprising. I don't really really even know how this happened. Um, in the first funding bill, it was like some one of the funding bills, you know, something to do with the reconciliation package, they're voting on funding for the Iron Dome, or something to do with the budget. Um, they're voting on funding for the Iron Dome and the progressives complained they were gonna not vote for it. They just wanted the bill to pass, so they took the bill out temporarily, always planning to put it back in. Um, and then uh, a few days later they funded it more a uh, billion dollars for the Iron Dome, which already has like $2 billion. Um, and then more money, not just for the Iron Dome, which again, does not need more money and enables only really, you know what, a, a deterrence actually for Israel would be if a little more of those Hamas rockets fell through, then they would not be targeting civilians, then they would not be killing Palestinians incredibly disproportionately, and then they may have an actual military incentive to stop doing what they're doing. Um, because of the because of what's happening with uh, mutually insured destruction, that's a re- just the reality of the situation. Because when once the Iron Dome was put in place, Israel became incredibly the conflict became incredibly one sided. Israel had free reign to do exactly what it wanted, and that you know that was always the United States' intention. That was always the you know the world's intention, and you know mostly you know the international community, which you know is code for a bunch of countries that would do whatever the United States wants. Um, leveraging that to, you know, look at the numbers. It's as simple as that. Like, you see thousands of Palestinians dying each year, and especially after two years when Israel pursues its mowing the grass policy. Um, and from there, like, you see only tenths, or, you know, fractions and decimal points of, you know, Palestinian lives, uh, or, you know, or Israeli lives on the other side. And obviously, I personally, in a situation, my ideal situation... Um, I would like to see everybody, you know, coexisting over both, you know, Israel and Palestine, new land, um, coexisting as it was, you know, with where Jews can have rights, where, you know, Palestinians can have full rights as well. And that is obviously what is missing now. And that's why Human Rights Watch, why Betzalem, uh, why anyone who can look up the definition of the word apartheid and read it can compare it to what's going on in Israel or at least with an honest, you know, objective, like, literally right in front of your face mindset. Um, But it really is clear to see uh, that there has been some very, you know, some definitely fractious conversations had this week in Congress about this issue. So the funding for the Iron Dome goes back in, and... Uh, that comes up for a vote again. It passes overwhelmingly. The squad actually splits up uh, Tlaib, Omar, some others. They voted against the funding. Um, and AOC, of all people, voted present. So then she ended up crying on the floor. Uh, you know, cameras caught it and everything. And then she went, goes over to Pramila Jayapal and hugs Pramila Jayapal, who, by the way, voted yes. Who voted yes, which is the best part. Um, again, to a bill that not only requires funding for the Iron Dome, which, you know, I talked about why, you know, people were saying, oh, pro- pro- opposing the Iron Dome, it's it's crazy because it actually protects the Palestinians to have an Iron Dome because, you know, if through some sort of like really kind of twisted logic, I can't even remember exactly what it was, um, that, but that was a take that I saw literally floating around. There was like, it, it protects the Palestinians to have an Iron Dome. 
you know, like obviously, you know, in a perfect world, this conflict should be over. But you know, if it's a, if it's so defensive, why can't the Palestinians have one? And B, you know, if you look at you know deaths per year, where this who this conflict has hit the hardest, it is time and time again. Palestine is time and time again. Palestine when Israel has had the Iron Dome because again, that takes away, you know, the Hamas rockets defense, which is just the reality of the situation. Um, but AOC voting press on this and penning a lengthy and emotional open letter. Apologizing to her constituents on Friday for effectively abstaining in a vote over funding for Israel's Iron Dome missile defense system, which overwhelmingly passed in the House a day earlier. Um, she could see be seen weeping on the House floor after the vote, using um, and she used a letter to criticize both the substance of the bill and what she described as the reckless and rushed process to pass it. She opposed the unconditional aid to Israel. Um, in the Israeli government, she added in a letter, but ultimately switched her vote from no to present, meaning a member takes a no position in favor of or against, but records there. No position in favor or against, uh, but just simply says, I was there. Uh, I saw it happen and said nothing. Uh, so the House voted for the measure 40 to 420 to 9. So it was a blowout. Uh, but Ocasio-Cortez's decision to effectively abstain attracted ire from her liberal supporters. Uh, normally, I find AOC a person with moral values. This time, though, as few other t- and a few other times, I must say she should have stuck with the squad members, wrote one person. Um, another person wrote, AOC primes people to leave. She will never compromise, then does. Meanwhile, an opinion piece accused her of being a tactical mess in the worst of both worlds solution, which, you know, it clearly was. Um, there's no denying that. Uh, like, it's, man's just absolutely pissed everybody off. Present is just the politically cowardice solution. Describing action in the letter, Ocasio Cortez wrote, Yes, I wept at the complete lack of care for human beings that are impacted by these decisions. I wept at the institution choosing a path of maximum volatility and minimum consideration for p- political convenience. To those I have disappointed, I'm deeply sorry. To those who believe this reason, is insufficient or cowardice, I understand. But, like, I don't get the reason. I literally do not get the reason. I, I would love to understand the reason. Like, I, and I do think it's significant that she comes out here in this letter and absolutely, you know, it's all over, like, online if you want to go read it. But she absolutely, like, trashes the Democratic leadership, trashes the process of bringing this vote, and pr- trashes, like, Israel and the principle to, like, bring this vote to the floor in the first place. But I cannot de- decode... For the life of me, why she would say present, you know, it's just absolute, it's makes no sense. Uh, she was not explicit about the reason for a change of heart, but hinted at a lack of time for substantive community consultation, as well as hateful targeting and the creation of its atmosphere, uh, creation of an atmospheric tinderbox of vitriol. Um, and you know, you don't really know what she's talking about there at all so the one billion for the i want to actually you know what we're going to go through this letter because i just don't get that because i get that she's a a against the way the leadership did this respect that b against the funding in the first place definitely respect that um but here she says um yesterday this is long yesterday the house called to the floor rushed one billion dollar Supplemental military funding for Israel's Iron Dome defense system. I want to make clear with the community I'm opposed to this bill, but ultimately cast a present vote. My job as your representative is first and foremost to serve with transparency and remain accountable to you, the people of the 14th District. First, let me begin with why I believe this bill should not have been opposed. Contrary to popular narrative, this bill was not for not for all uh, U.S. funding of the Iron Dome. Opposing it would not have been to defund U.S. financing of the system in any way, shape, or form. Since 2011, the U.S. has provided $1.7 billion for the Iron Dome and is already financially committed to continuing these funds through 2028. This bill adds an additional billion dollars in funding um, in one year to the system alone, bringing up a very good point that a lot of people just did not talk about, even on the left. Um, so, in addition to opposing the substance of the Iron Dome supplemental bill, the process of bringing it to the floor was deeply unjust. The legislative language itself was initially introduced earlier this week by way of an attempt to quietly slip it into this funding this funding into routine legislation without 
uh, any of the usually necessary committee debate markup or regular order a funding leap this significant in a policy area that is already so charged and fraught for many communities, particularly our own, deserve the respect of a proper legislative process. Unfortunately, this process did not happen. In the reckless decision, decision here, this is a geek part, reckless decision by the House leadership to rush this controversial vote within a matter of hours and without true consideration created tinderbox of vitriol, disingenuous framing, deeply racist accusations and depictions, and lack of substantive discussion on the matter. I want to be clear, the decision to rush the vote, virtually preventing any member from meaningfully consulting with their committee, was both intentional and unnecessary. Even the night before, as it became clear, the discourse around this issue was quickly devolving from substance to hateful targeting. Um, I personally had a call with the majority leader to request a 24-hour stay of the vote so we could work Due to the work to bring down the temperature, which is very interesting, um, and you don't know which. T- yeah, so it could be about anything. It could be about you know she's talking about the left. I don't know, or maybe people are you know saying mean things about her online from the pro-Israel side. I think both are possible because both have happened. To be quite honest, um, but I think yeah, I still think there is something that we do not know, uh, but it's very interesting. Um, so the one, so this is how it sounded, by the way, on a cable to, I believe cable. Uh, excuse me, the clip. Designated by Mr. Lawson of Florida, pursue it to House Resident 8. I inform the House that Mr. Lawson will vote nay. Okay, so it's just the House clerk, and because you're hugging, I think crying, uh, hugging Barbara Lee there. But um, yeah, so the one billion funding for the Iron Dome system, which is designed to counter short range rockets and more fire from militants in the Gaza Strip, which was originally part of the government spending bill. However, liberals threatened to vote it down, upending the entire spending package. As a result, Democrat leaders opted to strip out the Israel funding provisions to make it a standalone bill, which passed on Thursday. Um, yeah, so she really got pissed about that. I think that's... I'm, personally, if I had to guess, I'd say some stuff was said... Maybe at maybe at some internal meetings or something on Twitter um, that she really did not like within the caucus because there are some pro-Israel like hardliners to say the least in that caucus for sure. Um, Israel does continue to be the fault line for the Democratic Party caucus. The debate over the Iron Dome funding, the latest issue to pit members of the so-called squad against Democrats. So her abstention saw her break away from fellow squad members. Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, and Ayanna Presley, who all voted against the bill. So Tlaib, the first Palestinian American woman to serve in Congress, called Israel an apartheid state, while well, Representative Ted Deutsch, I would love to see this qu- clip, uh, accused her of anti-Semitism. Uh, that that is great because we should we should pull up a little Ted Deutsch action. He's um, from Florida, I believe. Um, Deutsch. Let's see if we can get a little Ted Deutsch action here. Um, condemning Rashida Tlaib. Here it is. She may have 15 more seconds. You have the gentleman, the gentleman 15. I have the gentleman 30 seconds. Is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. Mr. Speaker, we can have an opportunity to debate lots of issues on the House floor, but to falsely characterize the state of Israel is consistent with those. Let's be clear. It's consistent with those who advocate for the dismantling of the one Jewish state in the world. And when there is no place on the map for one Jewish state, that's anti-Semitism. <laughs> and I reject that. I stand in support of this important legislation. I thank the speaker, the majority. Yeah, so probably they're like the most like grandstandy like kind of way you can go about it. It's like, let, let's be clear. You know what? Let's be clear. I support Betzalem. I support Human Rights Watch. I support many, many, many like independent researchers and, you know, the basic clear conditions on the ground with my own eyes and brain um, that this is an apartheid state. Like, I, I think I can get it. I think I can get it. Um so, Rosa DeLauro said the commitment to the security of our friend and ally Israel is ironclad. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but anyway, that bill, moving on, very, very disappointing. And I really do think there is something that we do not know with what's going on with uh, AOC there and what caused her to change her vote 
in that way. There is some, I really have a feeling there was some sort of drama behind the scenes. We just were not clued into. Um, yeah, let's move on in 20 seconds. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. It's new. All right, let's get ready to take a trip across the pond of Buckingham Palace. No, we're not going to Buckingham Palace. We're going to Brighton Beach in England. Southern England, I believe. The beaches in England are so depressing if you've ever seen them. Um, But anyway, we're talking about labor conference going on there in Brighton. Uh, in the Observer today, Keir Starmer is battling to restore authority over the Labour Party after a bruising defeat at the hands of unions and the left sparked a storm of criticism over his performance as leader. So it's very interesting what's been going on there at the Labour Conference. So it's pretty much their big gathering, their event, their convention. Every They have it every year uh, in the UK where they set up their platform. They have a bunch of events. They talk about strategy. They say like, make new rule changes, and one of the big rule changes that Starmer wanted to make, as you know, pretty much remember at this point of the labor right, undisputedly, um, was all about how to elect the next leader. So, you know, interesting there, right on right its front. And the way it works is there's a like some major, quote-unquote, stakeholders in the union, or sorry, in the Labor Party, um, and you got the members, it's like a roughly half a million of them, uh, under the Corbyn era, who pay monthly dues and go to meetings, some of them do, in local branches. It's like you are very much involved in the Labor Party if you pay dues. And you get to vote for the next leader. You get to vote for people on the like the council, the committees, all that stuff. There's a bunch of different kind of offshoot organizations. Um, and under the system that elected the last three Labor elections, that elected the current leader, Keir Starmer, the last leader, Jeremy Corbyn, um, those were both... You know, one member, one vote. Each member's vote counts, and the the leaders decided by the members. Um, but this changed something. This this changed it up uh, a little bit. And Keir Starmer, kind of out of nowhere, which was very unprecedented, he brought into this party, this year's labor conference. There was a big idea that he was going to plan to bring it back to the old system that's been in place before the last three elections, which was a system called, yes, they have it, (laughs) in the UK as well, the Electoral College. That's right. Uh, They use that to really pick right-wing, moderate labor leaders. um, And that is a bunch of people, representatives from the major trade unions who are affiliated with labor, which are the three biggest ones in the country, uh, and a bunch of other smaller ones. They all send representatives in. That's a third of the vote. And then you get the MPs for a third of the vote and the members for a third of the vote. And the, both those, two-thirds of them, are most likely going to be leaning right. The members normally lean left um, in terms of the Labor Party. And that is what the big conference, the big kind of electoral college rule changes. So at a, head of a conference, Bill, is the moment where Starmer would introduce himself as a future prime minister to the British people. The labor leader on Saturday was forced to withdraw plans to limit the role of party members and increase that of MPs in selecting future party leaders that the unions united in opposition to back the move. So that's the, this is how it fell down. So there's a NEC, that's pretty much the council of people who vote on things for like labor party rules and A big chunk of that, I don't know what size, but a serious chunk is reserved for the unions. They send their representatives there, and you pretty much, you got to have support of enough of the unions uh, if you want to make a big rule change. But he was apparently, he could have gotten their support, but he was apparently was so bad, he lost it all yesterday. Um, After the humiliating retreat was announced, allies of his deputy, Angela Rayner, made clear her fury at the way of Stormer. And his office had allowed what she regarded as an unnecessary row to dominate the first day of conference and shadow, overshadow a set of major economic policies she was announcing in her opening speech. By the way, Starmer's speech not too exciting. Um, so at a meeting of the National Executive Committee on Monday, Saturday, sorry, Saturday morning, Rainer, Rainer <laughs> proposed amendments to the Starmer plan in a desperate attempt to find a way forward. Um, and it 
didn't just work at all. There was widespread dismay in all wings of the party over the way the Labour had plunged into more divisive internal arguments at the point when it had hoped to train its guns on the Tories and present leaders a future occup- occupant of uh, number 10. But pretty much all he's done is spend the, pretty much the last however many months completely waging war on the left. His general secretary, um, which is pretty much the main, like, real head of the Labour bureaucracy, is named David Evans, and he has been exp- pretty much in preparation for making this big electoral college rule change, has been, no joke, sending members um, of the party who would most likely, you know, vote for, uh, vote against the changes, um, and not the way he wanted to. They've just been sending members, oh yeah, you're suspended. Um, why? We'll tell you after the conference. Sorry, you can't go. Too bad. Like, that is literally what they've been doing, and they, his vote, which is, by the way, normally not even, they don't even bother having a vote, it's such a walk, uh, was very, like, much closer than expected. So, really a rough Labor Party conference for Keir Starmer. We will continue to try and track the downfall of Keir Starmer. And yes, you may be saying, oh, um, you only cover him when he's losing. Yeah, I do, because I want him to fail. Uh, anyway, so that solves that. We'll see you next time with News Flash.